to be here, good to be here. Now, one of the things that you do that not many people will be aware of is a thing called street epistemology, which sounds very, very scary and academic, but actually, it's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Right, so we go around the world and we ask people why they believe what they believe, and we have mats or lines of tape that we place on the ground, strongly disagree, disagree, slightly disagree, neutral, and then agree on the other side. And then we'll just raise questions to people and we'll see if the confidence they have in the belief, in other words, if the, if the line they're on is justified by the reason and evidence they have. So you're actually getting members of the public to move depending on where they stand on any particular issue. So you can see visually where people stand. But one of the other things that you do that's quite interesting is you say, what would it take for you to move from this position on this particular question to another position? Correct. What would it take to change your mind? What piece of evidence would you have to hear? What reason would you have to hear? What argument would you have to hear? Not to move from strongly agree to strongly disagree, but just one line. So if you're on slightly agree, what would it take for you to move to neutral? What would it take for you to move to the agree line? Because you wrote a book called How to Have Impossible Conversations. Right. You, you co-wrote that with James Lindsay. And I think that's a really fantastic book because many of us feel that we've sort of lost the art of having debates, of disagreeing, uh, without it all flaring up and becoming very personal. Uh, is that, do you think that is the case, or do you think that we can re re get that back? I think we can get that back. Well, I, I've learned a lot from going around the country, uh, going around the world and asking people. I originally did this in the prisons, where I asked prison inmates what they believed and why they believed and why they believe what they believe, and those answers were something quite interesting. You know, but from uh, burying dead, helping friends bury dead bodies to other things that I won't mention on live TV. But, mm -hmm. Um, what, one of the things that I've learned is it's not an academic thing, but there's just basic confusion about what people mean by words and what people mean by terms. But sometimes it does flare up, even in your street epistemology exercises. Uh, and actually, we do have a clip of uh, one of those moments where it got a bit heated. Let's have a look at that. Anyone who does not have the same opinion as you is a bigoted... A trans woman should not be able to compete in women's sports has transphobic beliefs. Point blank, period. Trans women are women. Therefore, they compete in women's sports. It, yes, so people, it does get heated, yes. People do get upset, quite clearly. I mean, you're, you, you do deal with some of the more sensitive topics. Now, are you doing that deliberately, precisely because no one's having the debates? So you, the, the academies have failed us, the institutions have failed us, legacy media has failed us, so we need to take it out of the academy and bring it to the streets. So we need to give people these tools for how to have a conversation across a divide to how to calibrate what they believe to the evidence. Okay, so hang on a minute, because I want to I explore that a little bit more. Yeah. You're talking about how the academy has failed us when it comes to these issues. Are you saying that people in higher education are just simply not having the debates anymore? They're, they're not having the debates. That's not how I'd frame it. There are certain moral positions that one has to take, and if one doesn't take it, it's not that one is merely wrong, but that they're a bad person. So the conversation has shifted from this person doesn't have sets of information. That's what Socrates argued, that you're just missing pieces of information from that to you're a bad person. Yes, the That's assumption the that, 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 that the slightest point of disagreement is evidence of malevolence. Correct. Right. Now, you have experienced this yourself. You were a professor at Portland State University. Correct. And you're not anymore. And when you... Thank the God. <laughs> And you, when you resigned, I mean, that was quite a big deal because you put your resignation letter out there and that went viral. Um, for those who didn't catch that, do you want to explain what was your reason for leaving the university? The, the, the university hired me to teach critical thinking and teach ethics, and that became increasingly difficult. The university really became a factory of social justice or critical social justice and any kind of independent free thought in which you didn't toe the line. Was, was truly punished most hardly. Investigations, committees. So it, it was really, not only was it a nightmare for me at an emotional and personal psychological level, but it made it absolutely impossible for me to do what they hired me to do. Well, but what sort of things were happening to you? Literally, you truly, you would not believe it. Like, well, I mean, I was it. accused of, okay, all right, we have time. Um, <laughs> I, I was accused of virtually everything that you could think of that one could be accused. Every kind of accusation, there was a constant investigation of me about something. Title IX in the United States, Title IX investigations are very serious. I was told at one point in one of my investigations, I could not uh, render my opinion about a protected class 
or teach in any way that my opinion about a protected class could be known. And when I was told that, I, I said, not flippantly, but very sincerely, what would I do if a student asked me if I think African Americans should be put in chains and sold in, in, as chattel? Because if I said, no matter what I said, I'd be rendering my opinion. Of course, the response to that was silence. So we have entire wings of university architecture that are dedicated to promoting the ideology. And I asked very sincerely, why, why is it that you're targeting me? Why don't you, you target literally the whole field of gender studies? That's all it does. Why don't you, you target an entire field? What, what is it about the opinions? And it's not even the opinions. It's the, ver it's the idea that there's a way to think about something and that I, full disclosure, I didn't vote for Trump, I think he's a lunatic, but I tried to make it clear why someone would think that that's a good option. And it, doing that itself, they thought of that as a kind of white supremacy, as a kind of, you know, tool of the patriarchy. But so they don't need to understand another perspective. Correct. Even that is... Continue. Yeah, attempting to understand another pr perspective is a microaggression. Students could get triggered. They could need psychological counseling. I'm surprised you lasted as long as you did. I'm surprised too. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised too, but fr frankly, the healthcare was terrific. That's one of the main reasons. I but isn't innovation and discovery partly about free thinking and bucking the trend? I mean, where would someone like Galileo end up in, in today's okay, system? Okay, but e I'm going to argue as, as some, somebody who's caught who believes this. I, I think that what I'm about to say is just truly deranged, but I'm going to say it anyway. Okay. Um, that's not the purpose of the institution. The purpose of the institution is to remediate oppression. Is to find oppression, is to give people tools so that they can identify racism, sexism, homophobia, and we're going to train generations of people so that we can disrupt and dismantle the existing architecture. But then that's not a university, that's a training ground for activists. That's right. You can look at it as a kind of Marxist ideological training or a Catholic catechism. So then what do we do about it? Because ultimately we have this situation where we know that most universities now are ideologically captured Correct. or at least um, effectively train students to think in a certain way. In other words, they are factories of conformism, right. which is the opposite of what they should be there for. So how do we, on a practical level, how do we change there, things? There are only two solutions before I tell you those. I want to offer you something to think about. Th think about training for a fight. If you're training for a fight you would be far better off looking at a wall socket for 60 minutes than you would be to train in such a way as to increase the likelihood that you'd lose a fight. So for example, to put your arms down here when someone could just punch you in the head. So you'd be better off doing literally nothing. Similarly, with our academic institutions, you'd be better off not knowing, you'd be better off looking at a door for 60 minutes or for four years, you actually save yourself a ton of money too. Uh, you'd be better off looking at a door than you would be to learn a process that would take you away from reality. So there are only two options, there are only two things. I'm, I'll tell you what I believe, but that's just my opinion, you can make your own decision. One, we fix the existing universities. I personally don't believe that's possible. Uh, people are trying to do that in the United States. Governor DeSantis is trying to do that in Florida. I personally don't think that's possible, but that's one response. The other one is the, the, what I believe is you have to build new things. You have to have a kind of parallel structure in place so that you have academic institutions, for example, that value truth, and then you have those that value social justice or oppression or what have you, and then we can let those compete in a broader marketplace. The problem is that the very governing structures and institutions for example, accreditation boards, they all participate in the ideology. So you'd have to have some way that those institutions could opt out and then students could be given a choice of what kind of education they want to have. Okay, Peter, that, that's very clear.